Okay. The war in North Carolina is important. North Carolina played a significant role in the American Civil War, and though they were the last to join the Confederacy, once in committed, they were all in. In June of 1861, North Carolina Judah were the first in action at Big Bethel. The 26th North Carolina went the furthest of Pickett's charge at the Battle of Gettysburg, and North Carolina troops were the last to surrender at Appomattox. More North Carolina men served in the Confederacy than from any other state, and correspondingly, more casualties than any other state. And oh yes, it was the 18th North Carolina that accidentally shot Stonewall Jackson at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Oops. We're gonna talk about three phases of the Civil War in North Carolina. As you can see the first phase deals with the Outer Banks, Pamlico Sound, Abnormal Sound, and the Inland Waters. The second phase is the Blockade War. That was from 1862 when the blockade was fully implemented until the very end of the war. Three, phase three is down in our region at the Cape Fear River and the capture of Wilmington. In 1861, General in Chief Winfield Scott, the aged war veteran of the War of 1812, devised the two pronged strategy blockade and amphibious operations. This strategy gave the Union forces time to build, train, and deploy their armies. Burnside's 1862 campaign. In August of 1861, Ambrose Burnside, who would later be notorious for his defeat at Fredericksburg, began operations against the force that protected the inlets of the Outer Banks. These inlets were the gateways to Pamlico and Albemarle Sound, and from there to the rivers that went inland to North Carolina. Burnside hoped to work his way inland and secure the vital railroad at Goldsboro. This important railroad junction was arguably one of the most vital spots in the entire state. The tracks ran into Virginia and west and carried supplies brought into Wilmington Port to the armies of the south. At the beginning, the plan went well. They captured the Outer Banks, moved into Roanoke Island, then moved up the Noose to New Bern, capturing Fort Macon. But that's as far as they got. They were stopped in their effort to take Kinston. This would have been, Kinston was the last stop before Goldsboro. Here they were stopped. However, New Bern would remain in federal hands for the entire war. And although the plan was not as successful as hoped or completed, the operations did clear the inland waters of Southern trade and deny blockade runners a safe haven from new warships. New Bern and the bases and its and the bases in the area provided uh, safe haven for future Union operations. It was the last Union effort to capture North Carolina until 1864. The war, as far as North Carolina was concerned, now moved to the blockade. The second part of Winfield Scott's plan was a naval blockade of the southern coast and its ports. Naval blockades had been around for centuries, but the first use of blockade as a strategy and fully implemented was in the middle of the 18th century by the British. The British again used it against Napoleon and again against the Germans in World War I. Blockade is the strategy of the superior dominant naval power. It it is the strategy of the Navy that controls the oceans through sea power. It leaves the blockaded with few options. Endure the blockade and the destruction of your economy or come out and fight. The Confederacy did not have a naval force that could challenge the United States Navy at sea. The ironclad program of the Confederate Navy was supposed to provide the South with a weapon that could break the blockade. 
diplomatic recognition by the British and other European countries was important to the South because it also meant that the British would contest the Union blockade. In this regard, the ironclad program was a failure and the British never did recognize the Confederacy as a sovereign nation. So the South had to endure the blockade for the rest of the war. Blockade is a tedious long-term affair that requires many ships and the ability to keep those ships supplied and in good repair and allowed them to stay on the line, on the blockade line. The organization of the Union forces was broken into two sections on the Atlantic coast, North Atlantic Blockading Squadron and the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron. Also in the Gulf of Mexico, there were two squadrons, East and West. Each had its own commander, its own ships, and its own territory of responsibility. The way the blockade runners worked was they would leave Wilmington or any other southern port with a cargo of cotton. A ship would leave Liverpool, England with arms or other contraband of war. These ships would meet in the Caribbean and exchange their cargoes. The British ship would head back to England with its cotton, while the blockade runner would head back to Wilmington or whatever port hoping for a dark, stormy night in which they could elude Union ships on patrol and make it into port safely with the much needed arms. The blockade of Wilmington was as active as any stretch of the war, of uh, uh, any stretch of the coastline during the war. And the number of shipwrecks, as you can see on the map, and sunken ships illustrates how active the area was. Wilmington was a good port. It was far enough away from the coastline to avoid Union block, uh, bombardment by the blockade ships. And it had a railroad, the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad that went directly to Lee's army in Virginia. Wilmington had the advantage of two inlets into the safety of the Cape Fear River for, for blockade runners to use. Old Inlet between Bald Head Island and Oak Island and New Inlet, seven miles up river where Fort Fisher was soon to be built. Without a Navy to protect these inlets, the South had to build forts. At Bald Head Island, they built Fort Holmes, and early in the war, they captured Fort Caswell on Oak Island. These two forts controlled all the shipping into Old Inlet. At New Inlet, work began on Fort Fisher and it grew into what would be called the Gibraltar of the West. Because of these two ways into the river, blockade runners of Wilmington enjoyed a 60 to 70 percent success rate, and there was a lot of money to be made. If the captain of a blockade runner was able to make two or three successful trips, they could make enough to pay for their ship. Some captains made many, many more, 10, 15, 20 trips. What about the ships? The ships that they needed for a successful blockade runner had special characteristics. First, they needed speed, and that meant good engines. They needed to be shallow drafted to be able to navigate through the inlets and the waters on the coastline. In the early months of the war, come whatever steamers that the South could get, they would convert as much as possible into blockade runners. By 1862, they were producing purpose-built ships. Deception was all important to the blockade runners. Their low silhouette made them hard to see. Their funnels could telescope, thus changing their silhouette appearance. Masks could be removed, and the ships could be painted fog gray in color to blend in on a dark, stormy night. This deception was intended to give the Union captains on the blockade a moment's pause. And in that minute or two, sometimes that was all that the blockade runner needed to get away in this cat and mouse game. The success of the Merrimack, the CSS Virginia, to wreak havoc on the Union blockade off of Hampton Roads left an impression on the Confederate Navy. The ironclad program was designed to produce more vessels that could break the blockade. In this regard, it was a failure. 
North Carolina built five ironclads, and their story is much the same as the story for the entire Confederate program. Those that were not completed and were able to see action, no, I'm sorry, those that were completed and, and were able to see action had some success, but the majority of them never fired a gun in anger. We see on the map here that there were five built in North Carolina. Half of them were destroyed before they ever set sail. The blockade on Southern Porch was an important component in the Union victory in North Carolina was at the heart of that part of the war. It would not end until the war was over. Phase three of the war in North Carolina is what I call the end game. In March of 1864, U.S. Grant was given command of all the armies in the country and overall strategy for the war. It was the first time federal operations acted towards the same goal. Each army in its own theater had a task that was vital to the overall plan for final victory. This blueprint for victory had William Sherman ordered to capture Atlanta. Phil Sheridan was ordered to clear the Shenandoah Valley, the breadbasket of the Confederacy, of all, of all Southern activity. Grant would contend with Lee in Virginia around Petersburg, and Ben Butler would operate at Bermuda 100, threatening Richmond. Sherman did capture Atlanta in September of 1864 and made his march to the sea to capture Savannah and make Georgia howl. He was now poised to march north into the Carolinas to keep his date with U.S. Grant for the final capture of Lee. Sheridan cleared the Confederacy, Confederates out of the Shenandoah Valley at the Battle of Cedar Creek. And though Butler was really unable to threaten Richmond, he did at least hold down some Confederate forces from helping Grant or helping Robert E. Lee against Grant that were besieged in Petersburg. With the election of Lincoln in November of 1864, the spring and the string of Confederate defeats, the handwriting was on the wall. Remnants of the defeated Confederate forces were streaming to join the Confederacy for the last major battle, and that battle would be in North Carolina. Grant now looked to the capture of Wilmington as the next step in the reduction of the ever-shrinking Confederacy. And while Sherman moved from Savannah towards Columbia, South Carolina, Union forces under John Schofield moved to capture Fort Fisher at New Inlet and the gateway to the Cape Fear River. The map shows that the capture of Fort Fisher and thus opening New Inlet to Union warships Made the old made the forts at Old Inlet unimportant, no longer of any value, and the U.S. Navy need not even engage them as they now served no purpose. Fort Fisher was built and designed like an L, with the short side, the land face, running from the river to the ocean, and the long side of the L ran along the shoreline. It was an earth and sand fort. And unfortunately, much of the sea face of the fort has been lost to time and tide. What remains is the land face that stretched from the river to the beach. Fortunately, this is the part, the most important part of the fort, as it was where the attack was made. If this fort had remained intact, it would be one of the premier sites of the country, even more so than it is now. The first attempt against Fort Fisher was made by Ben Butler on Christmas Day, 1864. Fresh from his disasters at Bermuda 100, he landed on a beach several miles above Fort Fisher. His landing was unopposed by Confederate forces. Butler had been an out-of-the-box thinker, and he had packed the USS Louisiana full of dynamite and parked it as close to the shore and the fort as possible. The explosion, it was hoped, would open a hole in the fort and allowing, and allowing Union troops to easily capture 
the stunned and confused garrison troops that had come out of their casemate safety after the bombardment of the fort. But when Butler arrived on the scene, he became a politician suddenly and was unimpressed with the amount of damage that the exploding ship or the naval bombardment had caused to these strong fortifications. He chose not to act with his infantry and reembarked his men and left. With the election over, Lincoln no longer needed the influential butler. So Grant was able to replace him with a professional soldier, Alfred Terry. This second attempt was made on January 15, 1865, after several days of bombardment. Terry landed again unopposed on the beach and marched to take the fort. The Union attack was broken into two groups. The main force of army troops attacked along the river towards Shepherd's Battery. A naval contingent marched down the beach, acting as a diversion towards the Northeast Bastion. The photo you see here is one of my favorites of the war. Photograph done by Timothy O'Sullivan, photographer, that shows the footprints of the Navy Brigade in the sand as well as some of the shrapnel. Thanks to Chris Fonville for publishing this photo in his excellent book, where he takes a look at all of the O'Sullivan photos, shows you the exact angle that they were taken compared to today's fort. It's an excellent volume that allows the reader to see the photo. Of the, of the fort very close to the end of the action. This next photo is of Shepherd's Gate. This is the point of attack, the Shepherd's Gate battery. To the very left, this photo is from the inside of the fort with the river to the immediate left and looks very much the same as it did then. One difference are the missing trees on the other side of the fort from where the attack by the Union Army came. The Confederates had cut down the trees to provide a clear field of fire, but this was the breakthrough area. From here, Union infantry marched up and over each of the batteries in the land face, capturing them in turn. The Confederates, when they came out of the safety of their casemates, where they sought shelter during the bombardment, only to find that their fort was overrun. The Confederate forces, unable to mount a counter charge, streamed south towards Battery Buchanan, which is now where the Southport Fort Fisher Ferry operates. Most of these troops, these garrison troops, were captured. It is interesting to note that the Union bombardment was not as effective as it could have been due to a Confederate ruse. The ships at sea used the Confederate flag, supposedly in the middle of the fort as their aiming point. The Confederates, though, had moved the flag out into the middle of the Cape Fear River, and most of the Union shells fell harmlessly into the river. As clever as it was, it was not enough to save the fort. There are several reasons why the Gibraltar of the West fell so easily to Union forces. A lack of cooperation between the fort and the forces under Robert Hoke, who at Sugarloaf was a cause. An ability to defeat the Union forces at the water's edge to make them at least pay a price during the vulnerable period when they were landing was a cause of the defeat. But in the end, the fall of Fort Fisher was a foregone conclusion. It was undermanned, undergun, and morale in 1865 in Confederate forces was disappointing. They were deserting in droves. And one must wonder about the fighting spirit of those that remained. However brave, they knew that the end of the war was near. This one blow compromised the entire Cape Fear River defense system. The old fort, the forts at Old Inlet, Caswell, and Holmes were now of little use to the Confederacy. The Union had an entrance to the, to the Cape Fear River at New Inlet. The Confederacy could not reinforce the forts. Why would they? 
Evacuation was the only option. So the remaining garrison of Caswell, Holmes, as well as Fort Pender, now Fort Johnston, at Smithville, now Southport, moved to the defenses of Fort Anderson, upriver, opposite Sugarloaf. The main earthworks at Fort Anderson were designed to control river traffic. They also built several miles of smaller earthworks that ran perpendicular away from the river. There were, they were a series of trenches connected by the ponds that ran through the property out towards what is now Route 87. The end of that line was the weak point. Federal forces merely marched around the Confederate defenses and outflanked the line and were in the rebel camp before they knew it. The Confederates, just able to evacuate, streamed north towards Wilmington. But in their haste, they left behind a Confederate flag from the fort, which was picked up by an Indiana private. He sent the flag up the chain of command and it finally reached Washington, D.C. At the time, Oliver P. Morton, governor of Indiana, was in town. And it was decided to present the flag to him. Lincoln was known to visit the soldiers' hospital on the outskirts of town. He took very little security with him. John Wilkes Booth, knowing of Lincoln's trips to the hospital, planned to capture the exposed president on one of his visits and hold him until he could uh, be exchanged for Confederate prisoners of war. His plan was set to activate on the very day that the flag was to be, was to be presented to Governor Morton. Lincoln changed his plans at the last minute and decided to attend the ceremony, leaving John Wilkes Booth hiding in the bushes along the route waiting for the president. It is impossible to contemplate how the capture of Lincoln would have changed the history of the war and its aftermath, but that flag is now on display at the visitor center at the Brunswick Fort Anderson. And I only gave you the short version of the story. Go out and visit. Let Jim McKee at the museum give you the whole story. I think it's one of the best stories of the war. All that remained now was to march on Wilmington. The Union forces advanced on Wilmington with infantry on both sides of the river, supported by the gunboats sailing up the river. A small skirmish at Forks Road, now on the grounds of Cameron Art Museum, was all the defense the Confederacy could muster for its defense of Wilmington. As the Union Army neared Wilmington, Sherman had left Columbia ablaze on his march north into North Carolina. Lee predicted that if Wilmington falls, so shall we, meaning his Army of Northern Virginia. And he was correct. With Wilmington captured, the federal forces on the John Schofield marched north to join up with Sherman's juggernaut that was approaching from the south and west to meet at that valuable railroad junction at Goldsboro. But there was time for one more battle as the Confederate remnants fled to join up with Joe Johnston. One last charge, one last hurrah, and that would take place at Bentonville. It seemed to be Johnston's plight in the war to be called in to save hopeless situations. Jeff Davis sent him to Kentucky in 1862 to determine what could be done to help Braxton Bragg in his failing campaign. He was sent to Jackson, Mississippi in 1865 to save John Pemberton, who was besieged at Vicksburg. Later that year, he would be sent to take over for another failed Braxton Bragg campaign at Chattanooga. He took over an army that was anything but a, brand, a band of brothers. It was filled with malcontents and general officers who either wanted command for themselves or had an ax to grind with another in theater commander. And let's not forget that Jeff Davis and Johnson had feuded since the war began. It all led to a lack of cooperation and disruption and only led to more defeat. But in, the fall, in February of 1865, Lee wrote to Johnson that he had selected him to gather, command whatever forces he could and stop William Sherman. Is that all?
Johnston had gathered all that he could and made his last stand at Gettys at Bentonville, about 20 miles west of Goldsboro. He had hoped to defeat Sherman before the approaching Schofield could make the odds against him impossible. It was a three-day battle between March 19th and March 21st, in which Sherman had gained advantage over his old rival, Joe Johnston. But with the lead elements of Schofield's army joining on the third day, the Confederate commander had no choice but to retreat towards Raleigh. As Sherman and Johnston regrouped in North Carolina, the war's focus shifted back to Grant and Lee in Virginia. On April 2nd, 1865, Grant broke Lee's lines at Gettysburg and the chase began that ended in the Southern surrender at Appomattox on April the 9th. In North Carolina, Sherman began negotiations with Joe Johnson for the surrender of his army at the John Bennett Farm. His negotiations were thrown into turmoil by Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War, when news of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Stanton wanted revenge for the killing of the president and hardened the northern position in Johnston's surrender terms. Negotiations were tense, but they finally agreed to terms and the largest surrender of the war concluded on April 26. On paper, Johnston's army included some 80,000 men from North Carolina to Florida. While the number was nowhere near that, it certainly exceeded the 8,000 or so men that Lee surrendered at Appomattox. Sherman and Johnston had a long relationship. They opposed each other in Sherman's campaign to take Atlanta and again at Bentonville. When Sherman died, Joe Johnson was to be one of his pallbearers. However, the old man was sick and most advised him against spending the time outside in what turned out to be a miserable rainy day. When asked about it, Johnson said that Sherman would have done the same for him. On that day, Johnson did, be, did show up as a pallbearer and caught pneumonia and died several days later. Such were the bonds that even opponents could forge from that war. So ended the war in North Carolina. It was an important part of, of, of the overall uh, war. And these many of the sites that were prevalent then and were important then are still here today for you to visit. I hope that you'll come out and visit the Brunswick Civil War Roundtable. We meet the first Tuesday of each month at Hatch Auditorium on the grounds of Fort Caswell. And you can look to our website or our Facebook page to get details on these events. Thanks, and I hope you'll join me in the future for other topics on North Carolina history.